and welcome to the FinTech Finance Virtual Arena. And today we're going to be talking about the value of quality of data to empower machine learning and artificial intelligence. Joining me today, I have Jeff Mills from iMeric. Jeff, how are you doing today? Doing awesome, Doug. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And I guess to kick things off, Jeff, could you tell our audience a bit more about your role at iMeric and maybe even iMeric itself, please? Yeah, thanks, Doug. Uh, of course, happy to do that. Uh, let's start with actually iMerit first. So um, iMerit, uh, we build tech propelled end to end uh, data labeling solutions that are focused on building the strongest data sets, empowering AI and machine learning algorithms uh, for companies in, in this space. Uh, primarily, those are autonomous technology companies, medical AI, social commerce, insurance, and of course, finance. Uh, so with a little over 4,000 full-time employees now uh, across nine different global offices, we focus on really the custom skilling of our employees to work on the most complicated use cases uh, within these industries I just mentioned. Uh, I personally joined the company about well, almost exactly five years ago uh, to help build uh, and scale the sales team and operations teams. Uh, now I'm the chief revenue officer at the company managing sales, marketing, solutions, partnerships, et cetera, globally. Incredible. Now, with that in mind, um, let, let's jump straight into the, the technology at the, the core of this discussion, this artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now, AI, interestingly, I think to a lot of financial executives and on, on boards, it's still considered science fiction. Um, even though it's probably still the backbone of the technologies that they, you know their businesses run on. So I'm interested to actually get some use cases out of you about what AI is actually capable currently of doing for financial institutions. Yeah, look, I, 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 the, the funny thing you said, um, the reality is people are using AI every day and they just don't even, they just don't even know it. Uh, if if, if uh, I think about where I started my career, I, I started at Yahoo back in 1998. And back at Yahoo in 1998, it was really just a uh, site listings, right? It was just taking web web listings and basically creating a taxonomy or a directory to to label those, you know, to um, for people to be able to find those those websites. Then you had like the year of commerce, the year of social, the year of video, the year of you know mobile, the year of big data, the year of you know whatever for the next you know 20 plus years. And, and the same thing's happening right now in the AI space. Um, I think within finance specifically, uh, first of all, the sky's the limit, right? Like there, there's so much that can be done that you and me and, and your, your audience can't even get their minds around right now. Just like, again, 20 years ago, the idea that you would have a phone that controlled your life just didn't, didn't make sense to people, right? Um, Today, I would say the, the first thing in finance that uh, people are getting their minds around is the difference between structured data and unstructured data. Uh, much of finance is kind of structured data by default because there's, you know, when you think about spreadsheets and cells and, and there's like a header to those cells and then there's numbers in those cells, right? So that's structuring the data. Um, but there's still a ton that's unstructured as well. So one of those examples would be like an earnings call. So when an earnings call came out, uh, again, Maybe I'm showing how old I am, but you know, 20 years ago, we all kind of huddled around the, the 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 star phone on the table and we listened to the earnings call because that's how you got the information that was going to come out. Yeah. Uh, today, there's a speech to text system that immediately, when that earnings call is coming out, is already putting that into text. That text is already being shot out into the great you know World Wide Web, etc. Um, from there. Um, there are algorithms being created, right, to first make that speech to text happen. So that's one algorithm. Another algorithm is going through and pulling out all the key inputs that are coming out in that call, right? So you have all of the operational metrics. Uh, are they EBITDA positive? Uh, you know, did they have, uh, you know, logo growth? Did they have revenue growth? What was their net revenue? What was their gross revenue? You know, all of those become structured data points that get pulled out from, from that earnings call. That immediately is going into predictive analysis systems all around the you know the world. Why that why that's happening? Um, even as far as the sentiment that's being said on the call, did they say these things in a positive way? Did they say these things in a negative way? Did they say these things in a neutral way? Right. So that's one like super basic example that I don't think most people get their minds around right away that that's AI enabled. Yeah. Um, investment insights and decisions across the board is happening all day, every day. Um, 
I think document automation is probably the one that is, again, the lowest hanging fruit um, that finance uh, companies are spending a bulk of mass time on, on creating. And that starts getting into loan processing, invoices, receipts, tax documents. If you just take receipts as, a, as an example, I don't do expenses anymore because there's a model that goes through and pulls out all the information from the receipts and shoots it through, right? And so, you know, 10 years ago, I had to take like a hundred pictures with my cell phone or I had to go to my bank, st bank statements and take each one, or I had to take all those receipts and paste them on a piece of paper and send them in, right? I mean, these are all things that we're, we're kind of taking for granted now, but they're, they're AI systems. They're pro uh, properly embedded in, in the culture of running a bank now, aren't they? Yeah, 100%, 100%. Now, what it seems to me from the fact that these are such core basic functions that, that banks live upon today, um, ultimately it sounds like the data that gets pulled from uh, from the, all these different, uh, for instance, as you said, the, the earnings call, the algorithms that power that, it sounds like pulling that data and making sure it, it's reliable is actually the most important part because if you start inputting incorrect data, that sounds like it's gonna have a knock-on effect to all those services. So would you say that machine learning is really actually only as powerful as maybe the data that is inputted behind it? So, the, yeah, I mean, uh, of course that's that's true. Um, I, I would say that it's it's paramount to the success of your of your project. Um, I'll give you a couple examples, but but I also want to be fair. So so there's a couple different architectures when it comes to uh, building machine learning models. Uh, one of those is like auto encoding. Um, so you know when it comes to like an auto encoding model. Uh, that's basically learning as the machine's doing the work. So think of it like when you when you hear about an AI model where uh, you know the the chess game you know AI beat the chess master or something. That's basically AI learning um, by making mistakes and and getting rewarded. And so in that one, the data is a little different. The data is still important, but understand that it's learning based on failure, right? that didn't work that didn't work that didn't, you know it does it and it does it a bazillion times to start to figure out like oh this is what we should do in finance i don't think you want to learn that way i don't think that's the way that's that's going to go really well right like failing a billion times to start with is probably not the best way to do it so I um, imagine them uh hanging around too long <laughs> and, uh, you know when it comes to compliance so when it comes to finance right structure data uh, and dense data architectures are gonna be the ones that, that are the best. Um, and structured is very complex, very tailored. And uh, you know, there's a lot of reports out there that say something like 80% of the time being spent in building a model is really just around the data sets themselves. Uh, and so, you know, again, structured data is the most li widely used in that. Um, and, and I guess I'd give you two analogies. Um, one analogy is just kind of, the algorithm is only as smart as the data that's going to be in it. And so if you think about an algorithm really being, uh, really learning from taking all the answers from a test, right? Think of all the tests we took in, in education and that's how an AI model learned was just looking at the answers that you gave it on tests. Do you want to cheat off of the A student or the C student, right? Like if, if, you, if you get the C student's answers, your algorithm is going to be about about a C student, you know, if you get A student answers, it's going to be an A student. I mean, it, it, it's really as basic as is that. And then I would kind of also pull in this other piece, which gets into um, some of the data can be interpreted in different ways, right? Um, if you look at it that way, that subjective nature of that type of stuff, if, if I ask one of my friends from New York, what's what's a good slice of pizza look like? And they would say, oh, it's thin, it's flat, you can pick it up, it holds on its own, like that is a slice of pizza. And then I asked my friend in Chicago what a good slice of pizza looks like. Oh, no. He'd pull out he'd pull out what, what you would think is lasagna, right? And so, <laughs> and so the subjective nature of these things is really, really key as well, because there isn't necessarily a right answer to certain subjective questions. And so, it is really important for companies that are getting into AI to work with, you know, people who can go through and really help them design 
what it is they're they're trying to work on and be able to have a team that understands that they want lasagna or they want thin crust pizza, right? Because because if you don't know the if that's not clear and that hasn't been properly defined throughout the process, you may end up with a with a slice of pizza that, that you, you didn't want. Yeah, now, you know, taking that example and applying it to a, a financial institution, obviously highly regulated industry, um, having that level of ambiguity must scare all the compliance officers within a bank. How can, uh, you know, and as a result, I mean, just to kind of spell it out, what failures could a bank see by having an AI or machine learning system that is utilizing incorrect or at least just poorly on that yeah, structured data what yeah what could be the potential worst case scenario well i mean I, obviously i i, I want to be careful about worst worst case scenarios because uh yeah anytime that you create more dependencies on ai or machines or anything i'm clearly you 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 can run into issues but you know if you had all of the um files you have in paper form sitting in a warehouse and the warehouse caught on fire you'd, you'd have the same you'd have a similar problem so i want to be careful that yes there's you know potential corruption or potential uh hacking or you know any of those types of things could, could go wrong um and so obviously having a very secure compliance system and, and everything is is very very crucial but you, financial institutions have been exposed to you know data issues uh all the way back to the to the beginning right if, if again a fire burned all the receipts or all of the ledgers or something like that that would have been a massive problem as well so um what i would say is the underlying one that i don't think people think about all the time um is really about disconnection from their customers and so that's the one that i get most concerned about because i think that ai needs to be used to enhance the customer experience and enhance the professional's experience, not just for cost savings. Um, and so, you know, imagine, yeah, I don't know, again, I, I, I'm an analogy guy, sorry, but, uh, you know, I used to have to go to the movie uh, store to rent a movie and then bring the movie back to my house and, you know, oh, maybe the movie wouldn't be there and there'd be an empty box on the shelf and it was horrible. Uh, now I just click a button and boom, my movie's on, right? So. By the way, a lot of that has AI in it, right? Like it's it's the movie was recommended to me. It was you know all of these things. That's a great customer experience that has that has been enhanced. Uh, finance needs to make sure that they're enhancing customer experiences all the way through, and not just trying to save a dollar. Why they're doing it? So so the intent of why they're building the system is essential um, to the success. I think. Obviously, the data issues that can happen are, you know, everyone's highlighting that. But I, I would just also highlight again this disconnection from your customers. I think that, um, you know, you want to make sure that uh, you, you're not, you know, you're not miss, yeah. missing that point. We, it's a really interesting point because so much talk about financial technology is, is based around um, just creating a more efficient system. When in fact, actually, technology can be used, um, especially now. Consumer customers of banks are are interacting with their bank far more uh, on digital channels far more often and far more frequently. So, I mean, speaking of that, improving that customer experience. If I could, um, you know, as a question I was going to ask you later on, but actually, I think it, it's pertinent now. Is you know, how can banks utilize artificial intelligence and machine learning to improve that customer experience? You, you kind of touched on it there, but I want to explore that further. Yeah, I, I think I think especially now with um, with COVID, um, we already saw this happening before COVID really hit. Right, people were already starting to become more and more digital first. I think now that uh, COVID happened, it just it really kind of took the last you know fifteen years and then like put a magnifying glass around it and just said like boom, you know people are no longer doing these types of things, right? And and so it just kind of fast tracked what was already happening and, and put a bigger spotlight on it. And so everyone's digital first. Everyone's going and doing the research and trying to figure out things and going through the full customer journey before they even make the decision on what they're going to do. And so um, I, I think it's really imperative that, um, you know, financial institutions understand that that's happening to start with. And I think most do, yeah. but there's a lot of things that they can continue to do right. 
I think that parts that we have to be a little bit careful about as well, though, is that, you know, it's one thing if um, your movie recommendation engine uh, gives you a bad advice on a movie, right? It says, oh, I think, Doug, you're going to really like this movie. And you're like, yeah, no, that wasn't a great movie. Um, and your financial institution makes a mistake, right? Like, Doug, I think you're really going to like this investment. And then, yeah, I didn't like that investment so much, right? And so and so the, the failure points are just so much bigger in finance than they are in other areas, right? In commerce, in uh, social and whatever, little mistakes don't, nah, no one really cares. But in finance, they, they care a lot, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, uh, I, I think that, you know, again, they have to really focus on that customer experience, but also understand that, you need to be doing it really good from the beginning. You don't get to kind of learn as you go and have a bunch of mistakes along the way and, and finance the, I don't know, the the game's just a little bit, is a little bit tougher. You know, the, the bar is a little bit higher. It's interesting. And I think that's why a lot of banks, especially the more, maybe the more traditional ones, have had that element of slow pace of innovation and, that, and as you said that does seem to be changing that does seem to be this kind of magnifying glass on the last 15 years and kind of condensed innovation in that probably would have taken another 10 years into one yeah. um now with that in mind then i guess um art of artificial intelligence and machine learning can help banks with that innovation journey rather than kind of being these 10 year cycles of innovating legacy systems you can now actually start to, to innovate quite quickly by using that automation process that comes from from artificial learning so how can ai start improving for instance the workflow um for for employees of a bank you know actually just start streamlining innovation systems for them too yeah look i i think ultimately um that's the first areas that you're seeing in finance. Um, you're seeing it within the banking systems today. Uh, you're seeing a lot of ways that RPA is being used, uh, robotic process automation is being used to, to basically circumvent the um, kind of customer service uh, side of the business, right? Uh, getting getting people to the right place within um, within the uh, organization, you know, faster by by not having them sit on hold and, and whatnot, right? Uh, but those also are helping the people within the bank. It, it doesn't mean that you're just firing those people. You're having them work on more important stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the research side I, I, I touched on a bit earlier on the use case side is giving, I mean, especially in finance, right? The, the power of information is is unmatched um, in the finance sector. And so the ability to be able to get real time information about these customers and about these companies uh, is giving, you know, again, analysts and researchers and whatever in the, in the, in the financial sector, the ability to really start using um, their real skills um, to go in and start making decisions on, again, investments or, um, should we, uh, you know, should we invest in a company? Should we uh, buy their stocks? You know, it depends on whatever it is. I, I, I think that access to that information is letting them start doing more higher level thinking because they're not spending all their time just trying to get the information. They're getting the information much, much faster. And so they're not spending 80% of their time acquiring the information. They're spending 80% of their time applying the information. And, and that starts to change, change their lives. I can imagine now. Um, one thing I'm also really interested in, because obviously I merit you've got you, you're a very global organization. I'm really interested in, in your insights into maybe if you've seen some of these large scale and um, you know, financial institutions actually contrasting in the way that they utilize artificial intelligence. Are you seeing some some regions use it more for the customer experience angle, or are you seeing some just hammering home that kind of uh, streamlining system? Um, or, you know, and, and are some actually kind of finding that great middle ground between the two? Yeah, I, look, I, I think, again, I, I think this is, we're still really early on in the process of, of AI, um, you know, and, and it's one of those things that it's here for, it's here forever. It, it, this is, this is not going away tomorrow. Um, you know, this is, this is only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and, and become more and more of like just normal life stuff. Um, but there's regional nuance for sure. So I, I think if you look at GDPR in, in Europe, right, that, that that creates a bunch of different um, issues for uh, for 
financial sectors, you know, within those areas. The GDPR laws can be very, very strict. Data privacy laws in general are, are becoming even a bigger thing in, in the U.S. now. Um, and so, you know, I, I think people are getting more keen to understand what's happening with their data. Um, and so you're starting to see a couple different camps. You see the people, you know, the companies out there who are like, we don't use your data. We're very careful about that. And then you have those who are like, no, yeah, we use your data um, because we're, we're making the experience as good for you as humanly possible or not humanly possible. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the, 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 the point there is that, you know, I think that the government getting involved in some of these things also forces the financial institution or, or corporation or whatnot to have to work a certain way. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I, I, I'm not getting political here, but, but what I'm saying is that that kind of does force their options a bit. They either can or can't do certain things because of some of these regulations that are happening. I think people kind of forget that they're using AI all the time and that data is helping them all the time. And I, I think that's one of the things that you know, consumers need to understand and not be scared about. Like the, the reality is the coupon they get at the supermarket that prints out is based on AI. It's, it's based on an algorithm that decided you would like that coupon. Um, every time you get upset that you go online and go to a website that doesn't have your information or you have to log in or whatever, well, it's because you said you don't want it to have your data. So like, you know, like I think I think consumers have to continue to 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 move that direction a bit as well. Um, and uh, as that happens, yeah, there are some there are some regions that are going to be more set up to to jump on it faster than others, partly just because of regulation. And, and I, I want to be careful there because it's not necessarily the bank or corporation's fault. Like they're 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 kind of forced into a certain yeah. way. It is interesting yet yeah, hearing how the regulator can play that that kind of uh, role in facilitating innovation rather than just kind of maybe regulating. But with that in mind, then um, I, I kind of want to bring it back to, to iMerit a bit slightly and, and kind of see how you guys fit into this ecosystem, because obviously with um, with all these regulations, but also all these innovations, um, banks probably they've got a lot to choose from and they, they just want to be Banking. They want to be, uh, the, you know, they want to be offering banking services for their customers. They don't want to be thinking about all this extra tech stuff that maybe the tech giants have kind of shown shown them up slightly on. So, yeah, how does iMerit help banks in this regard tackle these quite significant tech hurdles? Yeah. Look, I, I, again, what, what iMerit is going to do is we're going to help you structure your data um, in, in, in the most uh, most simplest form. Um, there was a time where where everyone talked about big data, you know, the year of big data. Uh, now it's just great data. Uh, no one cares about big data anymore. It's 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 really great data. How does great data um, empower you? And so, you know, when you, you you mentioned a minute ago these tech companies that are kind of the you know uh, new new gorillas coming in and, and, and moving quick. You know, yes, they're nimble. Yes, they're they're you know much more agile. They're much more aggressive on figuring out um, how to, you know, conquer a new problem, solve a new problem, and and their ships are a little a little sleeker and designed to move quicker in the water. Um, some of these much bigger companies have been around for a really long time, and so it, it takes a minute to to move the ship. Uh, it takes a minute to steer around uh, the icebergs when they're, when they're showing up because they're just they're just bigger ships. Um, I, I think there's there's two different pieces there. Um, one is first they're sitting on giant corpuses of big data they have so much data they have to pull the great data out and and that's where iMerit can really help them and other companies like iMerit can counsel them and show them how to take the great data how to make that data great to start powering their algorithms the newer companies are able to get in and move faster, but they don't have near as much data that they're sitting on as the as the kind of quote legacy customers um, do. And so I think that's an area where um, Imeric can help both, obviously, and we do a lot with both. We, we call them incumbents, being the the larger players, and then the innovators um, are are the the kind of new tech you know companies coming into the space, and they do work very differently. What's going to happen, Doug? To be honest with you, is a lot of the big um, 
the big companies are going to keep buying the innovators to, to bring in that DNA. And the question is, can they culturally get their mind around it? But let's be clear, 50% of uh, the Fortune 500 today won't be there in 10 years in the Fortune 500, right? I mean, I, th those are... Those are my numbers. Those are just numbers that, that I read in reports as well. But but you know, it's it's like a huge percentage of Fortune 500 companies are being replaced every every year now. Um, yeah. And so you, you have to be able to be agile enough and start to invest in these things quicker to to stay in the game. I think in finance specifically, the regulation and whatnot makes it harder, and it makes it. It's harder to just place a bet really quick. And so when you do go to make that bet, you need to work with a company who's really going to help you um, that you can really trust. And I think that's where a company like iMerit shines. Interesting. I, I, I heard the phrase build or buy. And uh, you know, it, it does sound like the, the banks are getting to that point where you know, they can only build so much internally. They can only buy so much externally. You've now got to start looking at collaborating and, and kind of moving with the tides on both sides. Um, and, and talking about the customer experience angle as well, um, you know, you, you hear stories, for instance, of, of customers who have passed away and, for instance, can't get access to their accounts. And imagine just the artificial intelligence reading that, that, that greater data, as you said, that's going to be critical because, as you said, a bank, it does, they have so much data, but they need to have that great data to be able to notice those small changes. Now, I think, Jeff, that's all we have time for, but thank you so much for your time. I, you know, it's been absolutely fascinating hearing you know, how this technology is going to really change almost exponentially. I, I hope you've had a good time yourself as well. 100%, 100% thanks. I, 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 we could have spent three hours on each question, so, um, so I, 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 great, I greatly appreciate you having me. Amazing. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. And also to our viewers, thank you for watching. You can catch the rest of the series and much more over at www.fintechf.com and of course, YouTube and LinkedIn, where I will see you in the comments, guys. Thank you so much and goodbye.